Um, I'm Catherine Farman. Uh, thank you for joining me in the twice as large room. So now I'm twice as terrified to stand up here in front of you. I am going to talk about responsive jQuery. I'm standing further back. Is this cool? You guys can still hear me, right? Okay. So I work for a company called Happy Cog. You may have heard of it. Um, we are notable for being founded by godfather of web standards, Jeffrey Zeldman. Um, if you made websites in the 90s, you may have encountered him at one point. Um, we do stuff like a list apart and cognition where we share what we work on and um, also publish guides to web design with a book apart. So we are a web design company. Um, we're based in Philadelphia, New York City, and Austin. And because we are uh, mainly a design company, um, we do all kinds of client work. Uh, presently, we seem to be doing more and more responsive design. Pretty much every project I've worked on since starting at Happy Cog last summer has been a responsive website. And typically, we'll, we'll always do the design for a project, and we'll do front-end templates, and we may or may not also do the back-end integration. So about half of our projects will do the CMS as well as the front-end templates. Um, if you're not familiar with responsive design, it's simply the principles of making websites work on all kinds of screen sizes. So when iPhones and mobile devices became popular, this became really important. Um, if you could serve one website to every computer, then it makes our jobs that much easier and people get a better experience too. Um, typically, the focus on responsive design has been CSS. Media queries enable us to serve customized layouts to different screen sizes, and we can do a lot of work with responsive design just through CSS. But what I'm finding in my work at Happy Cog is that a lot of designs really require tailoring your behaviors um, with JavaScript to different screen sizes. One example of that is the new Guardian website. This isn't a Happy Cog project, but if you go to theguardian.com, you'll see they have a link in their header for the beta experience of their uh, new responsive redesign. And they have this different behavior for their navigation. If you go to the site on small screens, you get this toggle drop down. We've all seen that before. You've got like the hamburger icon, and then you get a list of links you can go to. But on large screens, the content changes completely. Um, because they have the screen real estate to list those links in the header, they just swap out that kind of content in the, in the drop down. Um, so this kind of behavior change is um, something that I'm doing pretty much in all my projects at Happy Cog, and I'm starting to put together uh, patterns that can be reused across new projects as well. So for my purposes today, I am stealing a definition of a pattern from the book JavaScript Patterns. Um, which says that a pattern is not necessarily a code solution that's ready for copy and paste. It's more of a best practice or a useful abstraction, and it's a template for solving categories of problems. So I'm going to follow that kind of definition of patterns. Um, the code patterns in this talk are really basic, and they're meant to be applied in a wide variety of contexts. And they can also be customized to be made more complex, just based on whatever your project needs. I'm also going to show some user interface patterns. And this kind of idea of sharing responsive patterns um, came to me from Brad Frost. He has this really great website where he lists out different UI patterns. And you can click on them and see the code. Um, and I, I started developing kind of my own code pens and my own little code snippets based on this, this principle um, so that we could reuse them in projects at Happy Cog. So we're going to be talking about both code patterns and UI patterns that follow those coding patterns. The kind of overarching code patterns I'm going to share are of three types. We've got basic conditionals, we've got resize patterns, and we've got consistent patterns, consistent behavior, that's what I'm calling it, and those are my favorites. So the first is the basic conditional. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Everyone knows it's probably one of the first things you learn if you're programming is how to do if and else statements no matter what language. Um, and this is becoming really useful for responsive design because it's essentially mimicking what CSS does with media queries, which is conditional styles. Um, so your basic pattern will look something like this. And even though it's really simple, I'm trying to um, come up with best practices when we're using this in projects. So um, this particular pattern uh, has a function that you run on click. 
and the function is, uh, has a conditional inside it to check the screen size, the screen viewport width, and depending on what the screen size is, it's going to do two things. It's either going to do something for small screens or something for large screens. So this pattern is something that's come up over and over again um, when working uh, on responsive projects for clients. Um, a lot of little best practices can be found in this pattern that just make it easier to use it over and over again and to share it with other developers. Um, basically, using the on method uh, just to make sure um, that you're being consistent in uh, how you're firing events. And we also want to check the screen size inside of our function. So this is something um, that's super nifty because you may have a different screen size on page load than whatever the viewport is when your event actually fires. So you want to make sure that whatever you're trying to hook into, um, you're checking screen size at the time of that event occurring. Um, and then one thing that I've started doing that I got out of using SAS actually is defining variables for all my breakpoints. Um, if you've ever used SAS or preprocessor, it's really easy to just save common breakpoints that you would use in your media queries. And you can give them a name like small or large, or I even use like iPad or portrait sometimes, depending on what kind of device or size you're targeting. And I now started copying these over to JavaScript so that they're available to me in my code, they're consistent with the styles that we're making for the site, and you can reuse them in multiple places in your JavaScript. Now, um, one thing that I found that's really fraught with just this basic pattern is checking the window size. Believe it or not, getting the viewport size in JavaScript is a clusterfuck. It sounds really simple, and I thought it was, but it's not. Um, so there's problems with all of these methods right here, and I've used all of them. So the first is pretty basic. You use jQuery, you get the window width using the width method. The problem with that is that different browsers will return a different value if you use the width method. So some browsers subtract the scroll bar from the width, um, so you may not get consistent values across browsers. So I turn to the second one, which is inner width. Inner width will return consistent values whether there's a scroll bar on the page or not. Um, the problem is it only works in modern browsers. So then I turn to this last check, which is using different properties for different browsers, and it returns consistent values cross-browser. Now, the problem with all of these uh, techniques is none of them will consistently match your CSS breakpoints which sucks. Your CSS may be trying to do something in concert with your JavaScript a lot of times, and when they don't happen at the same point on the page, your stuff breaks. Um, this to me is why web standards are super important. If browsers could do all of these things the same way, we'd be golden and we wouldn't have to worry about getting the window size. But um, because they don't, we have to come up with some workarounds. Um, and if you're having trouble picturing like what, how this doesn't work, I recommend this website. It's called What Size Is Your Viewport With? And if you go to it, it will tell you the values um, reported by JavaScript using different methods to uh, get the width of your browser window. Um, it also illustrates how, again, these don't necessarily match what CSS uh, is reporting as your window width. When we got to this point at Happy Cog, um, we decided we're going to have to find a new solution. So luckily, there is a native JavaScript API called Match Media, which seems to be the solution to all of our problems. You can match CSS media queries exactly with this API. You use the same syntax. So in CSS, when you say do something at min width 800 pixels and max width 1,200 pixels, you can use that same min width, max width parameter for your JavaScript and it should work. And it will work consistently because browsers, um, it will detect the browser CSS viewport. Now, uh, you also have add listener method with uh, match media, which is super helpful if the screen size changes and your media query changes at any point and you want to check it again. The problem with this is IE9 and below do not support it. Um, it's a newer API, so modern browsers only. But there are a couple of polyfills if you want to go this route. Um, 
one thing to keep in mind, the more popular polyfill does not support the add listener method. So if you need that support in older browsers, you want to check um, for events um, for these screen size media queries uh, changing, then you're going to need to use the other polyfill that does support ad listener. Um, so this is the route that we're going with Happy Kai. We're starting to convert our projects to use match media. And we're also looking at inquire.js, which is kind of a wrapper for match media. It uses match media um, for a lot of its functionality. And it also requires the polyfill if you're going to use it. But it has some extra features, and it's got a really clean syntax. There are some other um, less kind of learning curve, feature intensive uh, hacks for getting CSS breakpoints into JavaScript. Um, but they really are kind of hacks. Um, you're kind of trying to like add pseudo elements to the page and detect the uh, media query, the style that's been applied to them. And using that, you can kind of infer that like this is the current screen size. Um, so if you're interested in doing like some quick and dirty shortcuts to getting the CSS breakpoints into JavaScript, I recommend looking up these methods. Um, but if you're doing like a client project or a production project, you probably want to move forward with something better um, suited for the task like match media. So getting back to, despite all that, getting back to our simple conditional pattern, um, I'm going to move forward with showing you some kind of basic non-match media examples uh, that are good for getting started with responsive patterns. So this is something I call the accordion box. It's kind of a hybrid accordion um, light box widget that I made for an e-commerce project. Um, this came about because I hate dialogues and light boxes, and I think they suck. I think they suck at all screen sizes, not just small screens, but they really, really suck on like an iPhone. If you've ever gotten a dialogue in an iPhone, it's like the surest way to like leave a website fast is to throw up a dialogue on someone's mobile device. Um, but the way that I got around this was for an e-commerce site, we wanted to throw up a, a pop-up that had shipping information. Um, on large screens, the, this made a lot of sense, but small screens less so. So we changed the behavior for small screens so that it was a drop-down accordion, whatever you want to call it. It's this example is just a simple slide toggle. So on small screens, you click the button, slides open, you get a tiny kitten. Large screens, throws up a giant kitten in an overlay. And the JavaScript for this is really simple. Um, it's exactly the same pattern as the basic conditional I showed before. And you're just throwing different functions inside the conditional. Another really great use case for using this conditional pattern is lazy load. So on a project we've been working on at Happy Cog, um, we have an ambient video that's kind of like this beautiful video, and it really adds a lot of uh, narrative to the page and messaging. But it's huge. It's like one megabyte. And nobody needs to be downloading that when they get to the page right immediately. Um, so we made it load when you scroll to that section of the site. And the other thing we did is we put this inside of a conditional um, based on the screen size so that mobile devices wouldn't be loading this video.